Most of my doctor's visits don't go anywhere. It's a little pain or lump here or there, and I tell my doctor it's probably nothing. I just want to make sure it's not cancer. So far, she's sent me home every time. Nothing to worry about. I always tell her it's fine. I wasn't worried. But I was the one who came in. It's not like she called me. And when she tells me everything's fine, I always believe her. Mostly. Wait, did I also have a headache? Is that another sign of things about to go terribly wrong? Because doctors do miss things. Send you home when they shouldn't, tell you it's all in your head. That's what this week's episode is about. In 2014, Maribai Rose fell into a mysterious paralysis. She almost stopped breathing. And when she recovered, her doctors basically told her she was fine. In this case, she wasn't. Maribai tells her story, here on Interstates, after this. The first thing that happened was I took my son roller skating. He was nine at the time. I fell and I broke my my scaphoid bone near my wrist. Something about that seemed to trigger this really deep fatigue and I was just exhausted. Then the bone healed, but I wasn't really feeling a lot better. I remember thinking I just needed time off work and I had scheduled some time off work and right when I was having my little vacation, I started to get even more sick. I mean, I was really limp and lying on the couch all the time. At that point, I was sick enough that my husband was just staying home with me because I was so sick I couldn't even make it to the bathroom by myself and he didn't feel comfortable leaving me like that. And then I started to begin to have this pretty extreme shortness of breath. I think not only was I scared, but I think seeing him so scared, something about the way that it was reflected in his face like, that felt to me like the thing that made me go, okay, we, we just have to go to the hospital. We have to get this figured out. Pretty immediately, the nursing staff took what was happening very seriously. I was very pale at that point and really obviously struggling to breathe. And I think they definitely took that very seriously. I felt more at ease when I was there, like, okay, like they're gonna take care of me, they're gonna figure this out. And then that first shot didn't work, and then that second shot didn't work. And then I was like, oh. They might not be able to take care of it. That was pretty scary. So it was a relief when the nebulizer treatment that they gave me there did work. And it was a relief to be able to just breathe. You know, it'd been days of, (sighs) you know, that was tough. You know, when they told me it was reactive airway disorder and told me that they were going to send me home, I didn't totally believe that. You know, it didn't feel... 100% right to me. And by that point, my breathing was under control and I was really tired. So I was like, okay, I'll go home. (laughs) I did not get any better. And in fact, was really right back in the same spot with the breathing the next day. And then the weakness came very quickly after that. I'd say the same day. I think the the same the day after I had been in the hospital for the shortness of breath was the first day that my legs totally gave out on me. I went to my physician and she, you know, took a chest x-ray and she just really couldn't figure out why I was feeling so bad. And she thought, you know, you just might have gotten hit with a virus that really took it out of you. I sort of, you know, day after day just was getting worse and worse and worse. And then I started to become 
very, very weak to the point where I would be trying to walk and I'd just have to sit down on the floor. Finally, my legs just totally gave out on me as I was trying to get to bed one day. I mean, they were just gone. By the time we got the call from my physician that it was time to go, I was at a point where I was not able to put any weight on my legs at all. I couldn't stand, I couldn't take a step. And my brother and my husband had to hoist me over their shoulders and drag me to the car. I think I got that something really major was happening before my husband did. He had actually kind of delayed going to the hospital. <sighs> While we were waiting for the, <laughs> for the physician, he decided he wanted to take the dog for a walk at a nature preserve close to where we lived. And so he left and the dog got loose. And so <laughs> he had to track the dog down and it took a long time. So, you know, we waited on my husband to get back. And then my husband was like, I want to make some tea before we go. I, you know, like, I, I don't want to go. He, he was this like avid green tea drinker. And I'm like, Scott, <laughs> we got to go. Like, like we really got to go. Um, actually, I don't know that I even said that, though, to tell you the truth, because I was so out of it. I was so, so tired. I think the way that I've described in the past, it's like you're underwater and you can sort of like, you have this sense of these things that are happening above the surface, but you're just like lying there and you can't, you can't get yourself up out of the water to like talk and move and act, you know? And so I, I was sort of in that place. So finally the tea was ready. And that's when they drug me to the car and I got in and I think what helped it start to click for Scott was they kind of sat me down and then he realized that I couldn't actually get my legs like from the gravel into the car. Like I, I didn't have the strength in any part of my body at that point to do that. So, you know, Scott actually had to help me like pick up my thighs and move my legs for me something shifted and he got in the car we got going very quickly I said to him as we're driving like oh I can't really hold myself up like I was like like starting to just hunch forward because it felt as if this weakness that had been in my legs was starting to move up and now it was like my muscles that I used to just hold myself upright were going and I was kind of just slumping forward in the car and I couldn't do anything about it. That was pretty frightening and I'm sure an image that Scott will never forget. And so right kind of in this moment that I'm like really losing control of my body, we hit this traffic. There's this one street, and if you're from Bloomington, you'll know 10th Street. 10th Street's like the main drag for our college. So we are driving towards town, and we're driving down 10th Street, and a football game just happened to have gotten out like probably 20 minutes before then. And so there is just traffic lined up in every direction. There's just cars everywhere and there's no there's no way to like no way to really get out of the spot that we're in and traffic's just not moving. And so Scott actually got out of the car and he ran ahead and he stopped and he talked to every single person who was in front of us and every single driver pulled their car as far as they possibly could to the shoulders and let us through. By the time we got to the hospital, I really had very little ability to move 
any part of my body below the shoulders. I could, I mean, at that point, I could probably still kind of pick up on my wrist. Um, but really, that was about it. And I remember the nurse coming out and she was saying, like, I need you to help me. I need you to, you know, put your arm around, you know, around my neck so I can help get you out of the car. And I was like, I can't. I could not pick my arm up to put it around her neck to help, you know, get me out of the car. Pretty quickly, even being able to like pick up my hand became impossible. And I think what was probably the scariest thing about that experience of becoming paralyzed was um, pretty quickly after I got into the emergency room, into that bed, I stopped being able to move my face. So I couldn't talk. I could talk a little bit, I remember. And I also remember that it wasn't easy to hear me, um, that people were really having to like lean in uh, because I didn't have much function you know, in the muscles in my face and the muscles in my diaphragm were stopping. They, they were slowly quitting on me. And so I couldn't dig in much air. So yeah, yeah, I was sort of slowly losing the ability to do absolutely everything. I knew they were going to take care of me, but I also sort of had this sense like, pretty soon I'm not going to be able to take in a breath you know I had this this stillness actually like you'd think of something like that as like a fluttery or panicky or panty kind of thing it wasn't that it was like I think because everything was weakening it was more just like a sense of stillness was taking over and so it was sort of a weird feeling because in some ways, it's like, you know, in deep meditation or, you know, at times when you're really, really calm, things can feel super, super still, right? So I was having this like absolutely terrifying experience, but also experiencing this like absolute stillness as every single muscle in my body just went still. my muscles like the actual muscles that make your lungs go open and close were failing they weren't strong enough to make my lungs open and close i can tell that i'm only you know opening a little bit now when i breathe there's just a little bit of air coming in i do remember pretty clearly the moment when I knew I was not going to be breathing for much longer. I couldn't speak at that point. And I remember just trying to like send the message out to the room. You need to do something now. And I remember thinking to myself, my children need me. You need to do something. My husband needs me. You need to do something and I couldn't speak it, but it did sort of feel like it worked in a way. Because I remember just like kind of fervently, it was almost like a prayer, like, my children need me, my husband needs me, you gotta do something, my, my children, children need me, my, my husband, husband needs me, me you, gotta you gotta do something, my children need me, my husband needs me, you gotta do something. And then people sort of pivoted to me, looked at me, and was, were like, oh, it's time to intubate. And then that all that all just happened very quickly. It was like all hands on deck, and I was very quickly moved on to a gurney. And well, I actually was already on something with wheels. I think they just like sped me to a room where they intubated me. And I don't remember actually being frightened of the intubation itself, which is interesting because I knew what that was. Intubation is when they put this hard breathing tube 
through your mouth, through your throat and into your lungs and it breathes for you. I'd actually had a lot of conversations about intubation with people because I was a hospice social worker. And so, you know, it's really important that people understand what their options are when they quit breathing and they're in our hospice program. And most people, once they understand what intubation is, don't actually want that for themselves if they were to stop breathing. And so it was interesting to be in that situation where like, I fully knew what was going to happen. I knew what intubation was and I wasn't opposed. I wanted to live. I wanted to live. I think it's really interesting to have had that experience because especially when I, I, I was able to go back to hospice work for just a little bit after that. And it's like you're helping people make peace with dying in hospice. And I don't think I could fully respect how hard that is until I had that experience. And every cell in my body was like, I want to live. I want to live. You know, um, it's such an incredibly overpowering feeling. At first, I was totally knocked out. So I had n- like no idea about what was happening. But then <laughs> they needed to take me out from underneath that level of sedation because it was also too difficult for them to gauge what my what was happening with my paralysis, right? Like, how do you know if someone has voluntary movement if they're totally, you know, knocked out? That was brutal. That was really brutal to be on a ventilator and be awake. And they gave me a medication that is supposed to make you not remember and it just didn't really work that way for me i mean i'm sure there are large chunks of every day that i was on the vent that i don't remember but there were definitely times where i was pretty conscious and um, able to remember and being on the vent is at such a weird experience because the air sort of comes into your lungs at its own rate, right? It doesn't like sync with how your body wants, you know, wants to be taking in air. So it's like my muscles started to come back online little by little, very, very slowly. And it felt as if I was almost sort of like at war with this machine. Cause like maybe I would start to naturally take in a little air just at the time where the machine was counting it as exhale (laughs) and then when i'd be wanting to exhale it would be like forcing all this air into my lungs and then they have to go in there with suction because you can't swallow anything that you know drops down in there and so they were going in there with this suction tube and that um, kind of scrapes the back of your throat while they're using it and it's really painful. So I kind of, you know, woke up from this deep, deep place of sleep. At first, I think my brain thought that I was at home in bed. I'm sort of expecting like, you know, my daughter was four at the time and You know, I'm kind of like expecting to feel her little body up against mine because she came into our bed pretty much every night. And, you know, just starting that process of like, oh, I'm gonna like have to move her to get out of the bed. And, And then all of a sudden I had this sensation of like there's something in my throat. And I remember kind of my eyes like popping open and and feeling this thing in my throat and just having this intense gag reflex and not being able to stop. And uh, my mom is a nurse and she kind of knew what was happening immediately and was able to just come over and help me calm down so that I could quit doing that. And, you know, I think probably 
got them to give me some medicine and help me get a little more settled because <laughs> I was definitely one of my probably most panicked moments of my whole ordeal was waking up with that tube in my throat. Maribai still had no idea where this paralysis had come from, but her doctor had come up with a theory, and pretty soon it had Maribai looking like a miracle patient. More about that after the break. In your states, Alex Chambers. We're listening to Maribai Rose describe a mysterious paralysis that started coming over her in 2014. Her doctors decided it was probably Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's a rare autoimmune disorder that can cause life-threatening paralysis. So they gave her a mix of antibiotics and good antibodies, and the results seemed kind of great. It was like a miracle. Within five days, I was no longer paralyzed. I was alert and awake a lot of the time. When I was in the full paralysis, I didn't have reflexes at times. They would kind of come and go, but by day five, they were constantly there. It's not the course for Guillain-Barre generally. Usually if somebody is affected by Guillain-Barre to the point where they require ventilation, their chances of actually walking again are pretty slim. So for someone with Guillain-Barre to be that sick and then come back to walking down the hallway with a walker on day six, like it's kind of unheard of. So it was interesting that that diagnosis wasn't questioned then. Mm I remember the physical therapist in rehab just saying over and over and over again, like, this just isn't what we see with Guillain-Barre, but like in a way of like, we're so happy for you. This is a miracle. November 8th is when I went into the hospital. And I remember by like November, say, 18th, Like people telling me like, you're going to be back to work in a month. You're doing so well. Like you are on the path to be fully recovered. And, and I was, I was so relieved because that had been terrifying. And to know that I was just like going to sail right through it was amazing. But then... I had to go on an outing to be discharged mm. so they could see that I could be out in the world. And we decided to go to my uh, the Kroger that I always shop at on the east side of town. And, you know, I'd been doing okay, hadn't, didn't feel bad. And then we got to the post aisle and all of a sudden I just had this feeling come over me like, oh, like something's not right. And um, the occupational therapist seemed to get like, we need to get you sitting down fast. And so we got to this little lounge area and I got in a chair and then very quickly, you know, I just felt that sense like what had happened at home, but really sped up of like, oh, get my legs. I'm not able to move my legs. And then it was like my torso and then my arms, but it wasn't quite to the extreme that it had been that day at the hospital. Like I could, still breathe and you know move just a tiny bit like pick up a finger or you know I I wasn't like 100% paralyzed so yeah we went back and I was fully expecting them to say I'm so sorry but we're gonna have to keep you a little longer and figure out what happened and they did not (laughs) they did not I think I was discharged. I don't care if it was the very next day, but it was within a few days of that. I was more tired than I had been, but I was okay. And yeah, they they just decided, well, that was just a, some kind of weird blip and we'll just go ahead and send you home. So I did go home and very quickly found myself back to 
being so fatigued that I couldn't get up and I couldn't move around and my color changed again to where I was just really like gray and pale all the time and I remember beginning to have more of those episodes where just all of a sudden I'd be overcome with this extreme weakness and wouldn't really be able to even pick up my arms or legs and would be just sort of stuck lying there until it passed. We had been given an outpatient appointment with a neurologist and we had to wait for two weeks while I'm obviously just deteriorating and finally we get in there and it felt really reassuring to see that neurologist he seemed like a really kind person and he was like okay like this is not Guillain-Barre I've seen Guillain-Barre this makes no sense but something's happening so we're going to run a bazillion tests And so he didn't want to see me again until the test results came back. And so we went back home, but very quickly. I mean, I was getting to the point where I was absolutely debilitated. Eventually, we actually did end up going up to Methodist Hospital because we'd heard that there were some good neurologists up there. And they ran a whole bunch of tests. And there were these like weird things that were wrong, like leukocytes were off, uh, like things that are just like not very typical of very many illnesses were, were present in that lab work, but they didn't know what to make of any of that. Mm. And so that was actually the first time that a doctor came and talked to me and said, I think you might have a conversion disorder. A conversion disorder is when you don't actually have anything physiologically wrong with you, but your body is kind of responding to your stress, your psychological factors by having symptoms. That did not make a lot of sense to me. (laughs) I was at that point, I was a clinical social worker And I had worked in psychiatric units and I had taken a full semester on the DSM and I felt like I was pretty familiar with what a conversion disorder was. And I'm like, yeah, but like my muscles quit breathing and like I didn't have reflexes. I I don't think, (laughs) like I don't think that that makes sense. Like these things aren't matching up. And he was kind of non-committal with that diagnosis. He was like, well, you know, the test results just really didn't show us anything. And, you know, if you want to talk to a psychiatrist so that he can make that diagnosis, you know, we could do that. And I was like, well, I mean, okay, I'll I'll talk to a psychiatrist because I'm thinking it's obviously it's not that. And if I can like jump this hoop by talking to a psychiatrist and like sure but then they were like but a psychiatrist won't be able to come to talk to you for three days and I'm like what I'm gonna lay in this hospital bed away from my kids for three days just to have somebody come and tell me that I don't have this thing I was like no I I don't want to do that so I end up going home and I still had that follow-up with the neurologist, and, and he had run so many tests, and I thought, okay, well, he's going to have figured it out. So I went, and the first thing that he said to me was, do you know what they diagnosed you with up in Indianapolis? And I said, well, I know on my discharge paperwork it said rule out a conversion disorder, and... They did talk to me about that, but I was like pretty quick to say, but I don't think that's what's happening. And he proceeded to tell me that it absolutely was a conversion disorder. He had no doubt about it. 
He even told me that I had probably been sexually abused and had blocked it out. And that's probably why. And my mom was with me at this appointment. And I think, you know, we were both just floored. Just floored. We were both very quiet for a while. And then I just started saying, I didn't have reflexes. Like, this, this doesn't make sense. And he just kind of kept, he'd, he'd either say, like, something like, well, that happens. Or like, I didn't see that detail in your chart. It was really frustrating to sort of have somebody be saying, like, your lived reality just isn't anything I'm willing to accept as reality. And this is the only reality. And I couldn't accept that reality. It just didn't feel true. And so finally, you know, and he said, I can't help you anymore. There's really no point of you coming back. Like, I'm not going to be able to do anything for you. He said, I can set up a, a psychiatrist for you. You can go see a psychiatrist. And, you know, I at that point I said, no, I, <laughs> I don't think that's going to help me either. And he left the room and I just lost it. I just started to sob because, you know, this was my, this was when I was going to find out what was wrong with me. He'd run so many tests, he'd sent them to the Mayo Clinic. I really thought he was going to have the answer. I thought he was going to say, it's this or it's that. I was ready to hear I had some kind of autoimmune disease or something. But he didn't give me an answer. He didn't give me anything that was helpful. And in fact, he gave me an answer that started to erode my sense that I could even rely on my mind. And the other thing which I quickly came to understand is once you get that diagnosis, it's very hard to find any doctor who will work with you because they want to look at your last consults, you know, the last thing that you did to try to figure this out, and they see that. And people are just so quick to agree with that without really taking the time to look into it. It was so demoralizing, you know? Like, I was raised by healthcare people, like, my mom was a nurse my whole life. My brother ended up being a doctor. Like, I really believed in the medical system. Like, I, I'm, I'm the, always been the kind of person who's like, you know, if you get a cold, you take zinc and echinacea. Like, you know, like, I've always been like a herbal medicine person. But, like, if you get strep throat, you go get antibiotics, right? <laughs> like, I wasn't at all anti-Western medicine. I thought it worked, and I thought if I ever got really sick that there would be answers for me. I met with a psychologist, and we had to meet many, many times <laughs> for her to make her, you know, complete assessment. It took months, and she found that I did not have a conversion disorder. You know, she said, you know, I think this patient needs to be sent for further medical testing. I think we need to keep looking at medical causes. I had known and I had told the doctors in December, no, like, the, the, no, this is not what is happening. And no one believed me. I don't think I had the letter from her that said, no, I don't think it's conversion disorder until April. I think the way I figured it out is very, very much the way people figure this out. It's almost never uh, with a doctor, it seems. <laughs> uh, so, so, I think it's a good time for a break. It's Interstates. We'll be right back. Well, 
Welcome back to Interstates. I'm Alex Chambers. Maribai Rose had a mysterious paralysis. A series of mysterious paralyses, really. At first, doctors thought it was Guillain-Barre. Then they decided it was a conversion disorder. Eventually, after months and months in the woods, Maribai encountered a beneficent old woman who gave her some advice. A quick fact check, we don't actually know how old she was. I don't remember her name, but I do remember her face and I remember how kind she was and how patient she was. And, you know, again, they ran some tests that were inconclusive and she came back in and I was expecting her to have seen the conversion disorder on my chart and just was expecting to be blown off. And she didn't at all blow me off. She said she sat there and she said, I really think that you do have something. We haven't figured it out yet, but I believe you do have something. And then she asked me, have you been tested for tick-borne illness? And that same night, my husband stumbled across the Columbia University Tick-Borne Illness Research Center online, and they had all these really good descriptions of various tick-borne illnesses. And so I had gone to bed, but he stayed up into the night reading about these different tick-borne illnesses, and he found one that had central nervous manifestations. It had respiratory symptoms associated with it. It had neurological symptoms associated with it. Pretty much every symptom that was on that list I had had, I had experienced. And when I woke up in the morning, he was like, I'm pretty sure I found it. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I understand what happened to you. And I looked at the list and I was like, how could it not be this? And so we went to my primary care physician and she, after looking at the symptom list, felt convinced enough that she actually did start me on doxycycline, but she said, I've never treated this kind of illness. Uh, what it was called was anaplasmosis, uh, the illness that best matched my symptoms. And ehrlichiosis is very, very similar. So we thought it was one of those two, anaplasmosis or ehrlichiosis. So she said, you know, you're going to have to find somebody that knows how to treat this. But she was willing to start me on an antibiotic. And that's when I kind of started on my path to treatment, and it was a long path. (laughs) It started off with a bang. Probably about five days after I started doxycycline, I started to have tremors. Mm -hmm. And at first it was like just in my hands, and then it would extend to like full body tremors that almost looked like seizures. I just thought like, oh, I'm having some sort of like really dramatic escalation of this illness because it wasn't that far outside of what I had been experiencing already, right? I was having a lot of inflammation and neurological symptoms already. So I was like, oh, this is just getting really, really bad all of a sudden. But then after like one of those full body seizure like episodes uh we reached out to the friend the community member who'd seemed to know about tick-borne illness and and said like this thing is happening like i started you know doxycycline at that point had probably been like a week before and i you know i was saying like i was really expecting to start feeling better and i'm like feeling so much worse and she said you you got to stop taking the doxycycline you're having this Herxheimer reaction. Um, and she gave me this, you know, detox protocol. And I did not want to stop. I didn't want to stop taking the doxycycline. I'm like, but <laughs> I finally found out what was wrong. And I'm finally like doing the thing to get better. And, uh, and so uh, we followed up with the nurse practitioner we were gonna see who seemed to know about Lyme disease. And then she also was like, yeah, you, you gotta stop taking the doxycycline. So I did and very quickly 
started to feel a lot better. Even like getting to the right dose on a medication, treating Lyme disease is challenging. And then not all of them work. So you're sort of just like playing like Russian roulette with these <laughs> antibiotics. Like, is this gonna work? Well, what if we put it in combination with this one? Is that gonna work? And it took us a long time to find the right combination of antibiotics. I got sick again in October and um, 2015. 2015, yeah. And I started getting a little better in June, but it took me another couple months just to start recovering my strength because I had been basically in bed for a long time. <laughs> hit in November of, let's see, November of 14. Right. And I was really like probably feeling like significantly better October of 16. I really see it as a systemic issue. Like I genuinely believe that the doctor, even the neurologist that, you know, ignored um, <laughs> uh, the things that were in my chart and didn't listen to me, like, I genuinely think he was trying to help, you know? I think our system has been infused with sexism. I mean, there is a very clear you know, if you look back over time, you know, you look back, like conversion disorder is a clear um, adaptation of hysteria. And only women, only women were diagnosed with this, right? With hysteria. And so then, you know, you go a step further back and it's like Charcot and it's even to the, the Greek philosophers who believed that the uterus was the source of illness. So there's just this like incredible lineage of sexism. And I think it, I think when things evolve, like racism and sexism evolves, sometimes they evolve into these forms that feel very subtle and hard to recognize when you're really in it. And so I think that, you know, that was definitely at play was there was just a sexist belief system that was already in place and we were just kind of acting that out. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is that we've created a capitalist medical system that doesn't give doctors the time to really dig into things anymore. And so they are grasping for quick diagnoses. Uh, if you do a whole bunch of testing on somebody and you don't have an answer, you feel really pressured to come up with one. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like you have any more time to give this. And so I think that's a problem as well, that, you know, we're not giving our physicians enough time to deal with the more complicated cases and the expectation that they're supposed to be seeing someone every 15 minutes is ridiculous. And I know a lot of physicians who are really deeply unhappy with that model of care. Mirabai tells the story of her illness, which is ongoing, in her book, Holding Hope, One Family's Journey Through Lyme Disease and Psychosis. And yes, you heard that right. Once Mirabai started to get physically better, her husband's mental health fell apart. The account is fascinating, and I recommend reading the whole book. There's so much more than we could fit in this episode. Mirabai had been in remission for a couple years when she told me this story. Along with the book, Maribai started a podcast called Badass Tales of Resilience. The podcast is on hold now because she's in the midst of a relapse. She said she's grateful that the relapse is happening just as the CDC is finally recognizing chronic Lyme, and mainstream institutions like Johns Hopkins are doing important research that validate her experience 
and the experience of so many others. Lyme is a complicated and, as Maribai puts it, weirdly controversial disease. It can be hard to diagnose, and it's hard to treat. Poet Daniel LaSalle has seen it firsthand. Lyme. Every ending begins with a field. Mom stems her fingers with cigarettes, says the smoke clears a pathway for her lungs. Breathing has become a sport for her. Eight years, she says, and wipes her face, adjusts her tubing to undo a kink. How a tick has pierced my family, with that bright red ring set flames around our farmhouse. Blood, a whisper of bruises. My family for years thought doing began with seeing a culprit, those tiny eyes. And finally, when the doctors did name the cause, I rejoiced, oddly, as if towering wheatgrass had somehow parted a doorway from the suffering temple. No, just another wall, and outside the tide creeps near. In the hospital again, Mom speaks in an altered voice, an accent not her own. Must be the brain, must be a feasting. We must keep her, the doctors say, learning again how to perform the most eloquent of drugs, waves moving, claiming. Again the coats, no food, screening, then looking at screens. See the infection, see it. It sloshes away, a ravenous puddle expanding, taking with it sand, grain, flesh, an ocean, quickly then, another ocean. Oh, what ladder down is the body, this time respiratory failure. Not the oxygen tank, Mom says. That's how they hook you. Her blanket smell of smoke. Beyond her window, there's a fire unattended. It doesn't end this disease. When the meds reach their location, Cells fester and spill through organs. Another round. Mom gets dizzy from the leaving, the tick that's become her. Does a blood-yoked animal ever sicken, tune to a pulsing, and wonder if in blood it's not blood, but where the blood goes? Forlorn, the wicked oars become anchors. That's from Daniel LaSalle's book of poems, Spit. Along with questions of health and illness and growing up amidst a declining marriage, the book has a whole lot of llamas. That's it for the show. You've been listening to Interstates from WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana. If you have a story for us or you've got some sound we should hear, let us know at wfiu.org slash interstates. And hey, if you like the show, you can review and rate us on Apple or Spotify. And what's even more fun than that is telling a friend. All right, we've got your quick moment of slow radio coming up. But first, the credits. The Interstates team is me, Alex Chambers, with Violet Barron, Jillian Blackburn, Avi Forrest, and Jay Upshaw. Our executive producer is Eric Bolstridge. 
Thanks to Louie Ann Johnson of WFIU's Poets Weave for the recording of Daniel LaSalle's poem. Our theme song is by Amy Olsner and Justin Vollmer. Additional music in this episode from Ramon Monras Sender, Backward Collective, and the artists at Universal Production Music. Special thanks this week to Maribai Rose and Daniel LaSalle. All right, time for some found sound. That was Raking Leaves, recorded by Patsy Ron. Until next week, I'm Alex Chambers. Thanks, as always, for listening. <laughs>